Kia ora koutou. It's, um, it's time for our webinar to start again, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Janet Parker to you. Janet is gerontology nurse practitioner in the community and residential aged care, Nākai Tiaki Komatua at Waitemata District Health Board. Janet has practiced in the community, firstly as a district nurse, and then as a gerontology nurse specialist. She registered as nurse practitioner in older adults in 2010, and she's the clinical lead for the Waitemata BHB's Community Gerontology Nursing Service. Under Janet's leadership, the team provides assessment, advice, and management for older adults with complex health issues in the community and in residential aged care. Kia ora Janet, welcome. Kia ora, thank you for inviting me to do this webinar on falls and falls prevention in older adults. Um, as you know now, I work in the community in residential aged care, but I've tried to make it a little bit more generic so that you can um, take things from it for, from whatever setting that you work in. So I'd just like to start with a little story so you can sit back and relax. And this story is about Mrs. T. So Mrs. T is a fit and agile 90 year old who lives in a rest home. And she has a medical background of osteoporosis, macular degeneration, hypertension and stress incontinence. Mrs. T got up during the night to go to the toilet without calling the caregiver or putting on the lights because she didn't want to disturb anyone. She tripped on her bedclothes, falling heavily to the ground, sustaining a distal fractured right humerus. She was transferred to hospital and a cast was applied before she was discharged back to her rest home. Over the next few days, Mrs. T became delirious and resistant to care, accusing the staff of being Japanese prisoner of war guards. She refused to eat or drink and became dehydrated. She was very agitated despite analgesia and PR inhaloperidol, and so they called mental health services for older adults. Two days later, she complained of central chest pain and was rushed back to hospital where she was diagnosed with a non-STEMI. She was kept for further tests and developed heart failure before dying from another MI. So that's Mrs. T's story and that's based on a true story. And why I read that story to you is to help you understand that one thing leads to another with older adults. And that one thing can sometimes be quite small, like not calling someone to get up at night to go to the toilet and slipping on the bedclothes. And then before you know it, you've got someone with very poor outcomes. Now we can't prevent every fall and there will always be Mrs. T's, but what I want you to um, understand is that when someone falls, it's an opportunity to learn to try and prevent the next fall or reduce risk for the next fall. So that overall falls incidence reduces and quality of life improves. So these are the objectives for the next, for this session. We're going to identify the people who are highest risk for falls. We're going to look at the components of falls. We're going to look at falls assessments for the individual and for the population. And we're going to look at falls interventions, what works. And depending on how I go with my time management, um, we'll see how much detail I can squeeze in. So first of all, just some statistics. So falls is the leading cause of injury related hospitalizations in people who are aged 65 years and over. And once they're over 85, falls accounts for 40% of injury related deaths. Falls often re um, result in injury and there's been lots of studies on falls and on falls prevention. So I'm not going to bore you with reading all those stats out. But the most common injury that requires hospitalization amongst older adults is fractured hip. Falls rates vary across the settings. So um, in community dwelling older adults, between 30 and 50% will fall every year. And this increases to about 50% for people who are aged 80 years and over. And in aged care, approximately half the individuals who live in the facility will fall annually. So that's a high rate of falls. 
In the inpatient settings too, falls rates can be quite high and they vary according to the, um, the subgroup of the population. So um, falls rates, for example, for stroke patients can be very high. But the take home message for all these statistics is that those who have fallen more than once in the past six months are more likely to fall again. So these are the people when you're seeing them in whatever setting, whether it be in the primary care practice, in the acute setting, in residential aged care or the community, if they've fallen more than once in the past six months, that should be a red flag to you. So what is a fall? So this is the um, definition that I have chosen. It's unintentionally coming to rest on the ground, floor or other lower level, but not as a result of syncope or of overwhelming force. So if you're trotting along and someone gives you a punch or a push and you fall over, although you fall and it doesn't meet the definition of a fall. If you're standing up from your bed, you feel dizzy and you sit down abruptly on the bed, that is a, um, a fall. So old adults frequently have incidents that meet the definition of a fall, but they'll use other words. They'll say, oh, I tripped or I stumbled or um, I, I managed to hold on to something. And they may not report such incidents. So it pays to ask a few questions about um, and use other words apart from fall. Would you have fallen if you hadn't managed to hold on to something is quite a good question that I like to ask. Okay, so what causes falls? Falls are complex, okay? Um, and I think by looking at the amount of research that's been done on falls, we come to realize how complex it is. So falls are generally um, the end result of multiple contributing factors that interact with each other. And you can unpack a fall by looking at it from different perspectives. So you can look at a fall according to the intrinsic factors that are there. And those intrinsic factors are related to the age and or pathology of the person. So illnesses that increase risk for falls, for example, or um, medication that they're taking, for example. And then there's the environment um, that can um, cause a fall on top of the pathology that means that the person doesn't react as quickly. So accidental or extrinsic falls can occur in anyone. And what happens is the stress of the environment and the hazard overwhelms the individual's ability to maintain homeostatic capacity. And we all fall from time to time. But it's the outcome of the fall that makes it particularly serious for our older adults. So the next few slides, we're going to look at intrinsic factors and we're going to look at some extrinsic factors and we're going to do a little focus on medications as medications is one of my things. Okay, um, de-prescribing, not prescribing. <laughs> okay, so intrinsic factors and where I could find the relative risk, I've added it in for you so you can see um, the difference between a person with that particular pathology compared to a person without that pathology. So if you look at central processing, for example, um, the relative risk of falling in people who are depressed is more than twice that of someone who is not depressed. And if you look at postural instability, um, so neuromotor, mus muscle weakness, um, the, the relative risk is over four times compared to someone who does not have any muscle um, weakness issues. Um, postural instability in older adults um, is a combination of a lot of different things and can be due to things like um, impairment of vision, reduction of reflexes and tactile sensors, the um, reduced proprioception that they have, um, the vestibular sensory input, reduced glare tolerance, a lot of pathological processes that um, um, occur as we get older come together to increase risk for falls. And things like, um, we're moving to the next one, cardiovascular, for example, small reductions in blood pressure 
may produce cerebral ischemic symptoms such as dizziness and increased risk for falls or syncope. And then the other thing to think about with older adults is that they're more at risk of dehydration in response to uh, medicines they're on, such as um, diuretics. Okay. And then on top of that, um, slowed processing reduces and slows the ability of the older adult to react and um, maintain that homeostatic capacity that prevents the fall. So you can see just on this slide here, history of falls. If someone has a history of fall, their relative risk of falling compared to someone who hasn't is three times the amount. Age in itself is a risk for falling. Using assistive devices is a risk for falling. It's not the actual use of the device, it's the fact that the person needs one. And then this slide on extrinsic factors. Um, these are the sorts of things when you're doing a home visit or you're going into someone's room in aged care, these are the things to look out for. What is the surface like? Are there rugs around the place for the person to trip over on? Is the floor slippery when it's a little bit wet? Is there clutter in the walkway for them to um, fall over? Or the cats, I don't know about you, but my cat has nearly tripped me over several times. Um, clothing, poorly um, fitting footwear, um, slippery slippers, for example. Um, and then there's other factors. So um, in the home, for example, the lack of handrails where they're required in the shower or on the stairs, the front door steps, the back door steps, um, alcohol intake. And then of course, um, a biggie is medications and polypharmacy, which we're going to look at. So these are the biggest offenders when it comes to falls and older adults. So um, they're there for you in all their glory. Um, and, but just the fact that someone is on more than four medicines will increase risk for falls. And the other thing that I'm going to, I want to point out to you is that a lot of these medicines have an anticholinergic burden and that the anticholinergic burden of the medicines that someone has are additive. So um, they have an increasing um, impact on the person on their falls risk, as well as on cognition and other things. Okay, so let's look at anticholinergic burden. So this is the cumulative effect of using multiple medicines with an anticholinergic burden. And anticholinergic burden, increased anticholinergic burden, is associated with clinically significant adverse effects. And there's a list of them there. Blurred vision, for example, dried eyes, constipation, dry mouth, urinary retention, decreased sweating, cognitive impairment, confusion, delirium, dizziness, drowsiness. And also, although I haven't written there, it does increase risk for mortality. Okay. So normally um, there are age-related physiological changes, for example, decreased renal function and also pre-existing clinical conditions such as dementia, which makes the older adult more sensitive to the adverse effect of medicines with an anticholinergic um, burden on their system. So what I advise is when you are doing a review of your residents or your patients, um, look at their medicine list and consider the anticholinergic burden that they're under from those medicines and consider alternative medicines or non-pharmacologic options if possible. So the other thing to think about with anticholinergic burden is as the um, patient, the resident, the person um, becomes unwell or gradually uh, more fragile, more frail. Sometimes we attribute that to their age and their increasing frailty rather than to the medicines that they're on. And failure to recognise the adverse effects of, um, of an anticholinergic burden will predispose that patient to increased risk. Physical risk, psychological risk and increased risk of them having to move into care. So the take home message is reduce anticholinergic burden wherever possible. And there's a um, 
link there to Aging Brain, where there is a tool that you can use and you can score the anticholinergic burden of your um, patient's medication list and then consider what you're going to do. So clinically, um, the research su suggests that an anticholinergic burden scale of three or more is considered significant. So if someone's got more than a score of three, um, I suggest that you look at their medicines and see what you can do. And for example, um, oxybutynin has an anticholinergic burden score of three all by itself, same as amitriptyline. And then lots of other common medicines that your patients are taking will have a score of one, such as morphine, risperidone, digoxin, furosemide. And so you can see that quite quickly you can um, have an anticholinergic um, burden scale of three or more. Okay, so moving on, I'll move off my um, um, platform now about deprescribing. Um, the top four risk factors um, for your population are people who are aged over 80 who have a, or who have a history of falls or who are more than four medicines, use a, de a mobility device, may be cognitively impaired or depressed, have gait or balance deficits, or arthritis or postural hypertension. These are the ones that are highest risk of falling. These are the ones when they walk through your door or you see them, you should red flag them. So here's an example. Now, as I walk, as I um, read through this, I want you to think about what, what do you think is falls risks are um, from what you know and what you've learned so far. So Mr. Peterson, he's 81 and he lives in a rest home. You can see his medical background there of osteoarthritis, both knees and hips, hypertension, heart failure, renal impairment, renal um, prostatism, macular degeneration and cognitive impairment. He's on a number of medicines, paracetamol, laxol, furosemide, salazapril, zopiclone, doxazosin, um, cholecalciferol. His baseline recordings, blood pressure seated is 120 on 70 and standing is 100 on 60, heart rate 76, oxygen stats 97% and respiratory rate 18. Now Mr. Peterson is a tall, slim, fiercely independent man who walks slowly with a walking frame. So just take a moment. Normally I'd break people up into groups and make them do some work here, but just think for a moment about what you think his risk for falls are. I'm going to just give you a few seconds and then we're going to move on and I'll run through them. Okay. Okay, so here are his risk factors for falls. Now, just going back to his story, it doesn't seem too bad. Okay, he's 81, he hasn't got a terribly long list. He's not on an awful lot of medicines. Okay, the blood pressure looks a bit low. But when you actually break it down, these are his risk factors for falls. The fact that he's got osteoarthritis, so he's got stiff knees and hips. He's got altered gait, he walks slowly. He walks with an assistive device. He may have urinary frequency and urgency because of his prostatism. He's got poor eyesight, cognitive impairment. He's got a blood pressure drop. And he has heart failure, which, um, people, which makes people feel tired and weak. He has polypharmacy. He's got specific medicines that have specific effects on him. So frizomide, which is diuresing him and making him run to the toilet. Salazapril, which can drop blood pressure. So be clone. Um, make him sleepy. Doxazosin, again, another one that cause, causes postural drop in blood pressure. You look at his anticholinergic burden and it's actually four, so it's significant. He's over 80, so he's in that population of risk and he wishes to be independent, so he may not always ring the bell for assistance. So that Mr. Peterson, who probably didn't look too bad when you looked at his um, summary before, actually has a very high risk of falling. So amongst your population, the people 
in um, who have the highest risk of falls, and this is taken um, from um, the RN Care Guide. So these are people who actually live in aged care. These are the people that are able to stand, but they need assistance with transfer. So they're the ones that will get up, stand up, can't do anything more and fall over. Those are incontinent, those who are cognitively impaired and those who are new to the facility or new to the environment. So it might be the acute um, setting that they're new to. So they're the highest, at the highest risk of falling. Now, I know I'm talking to the converted here, but these are just some um, ideas of complications from falls. There's not just the fractures, there's the soft tissue injuries, there's the admission to hospital with the risks that come from um, further things going wrong for them, such as being put to bed and becoming deconditioned, pressure injuries, pneumonia, depression. And the deconditioning leads to unsteadiness, leading to more falls. Okay, risk of falling, a fall with a long lie on the floor can result in increased weakness and is associated with secondary consequences such as pneumonia, rhabdomyolysis, hospitalization, prolonged recovery. And of course, when you fall, you have fear of falling. So a lot of older people who are falling are fearful of falling and they will decrease their activity to try and reduce risk. Um, this causes loss of confidence, causes muscle weakness, causes further functional decline. So it quickly can become a um, downward spiral that will lead to either placement or increasing level of care. So it can be a bit of a dismal story unless we can cut in at the top of the spiral and stop it. So getting back to Mr. Peterson, so he's in the rest home, he's having a rest on his bed after lunch, he's been asleep and he wakes up with a strong urge to pass urine. He gets up as quickly as he can and rushes to the toilet without his walking frame. He falls over in the toilet and he has a skin tear on his right arm. He manages to pull the call bell and you respond. Okay, so just think about what you would do in this situation. So if you are a caregiver or HCA listening to this or someone that doesn't really understand the situation, you would seek help and then you would stay with Mr. Peterson um, to keep him calm and to reassure him while that help arrives. If you're the person, the clinician um, that has um, some knowledge, then you're going to think, is he alert and orientated? You're gonna ask him, how are you? and What happened? Because you want to find out before he starts to forget. Can he move all four limbs? Where does it hurt? Can he get up by himself? Is it safe to move him? These are the questions that will be running through your mind. You'll take some baseline observations and you will decide whether you're going to do neurologic observations if you have any suspicion that he hit his head. You're going to check in for other injuries such as bruising or other skin tears and you're going to monitor him regularly until you're satisfied that, is, that he's stable. If this is happening at home and you've got any sense of concern, you're going to ring um, for an ambulance for someone to come and help and make that assessment for you or to make a decision about whether this man needs to go to hospital or not. So those are some of the thoughts that will run through your mind. Fortunately for you, when you get to Mr. Peterson, he's conscious, he's alert and oriented, and he's already getting up the floor, up off the floor, and you think, phew, he can move all of his limbs and he denies any pain apart from feeling a little shaky. So you check his um, baseline observations, and his seated BP is 120 on 80, like it was before, standing 100 on 65, heart rate 72 respiratory rate 20 oxygen stats normal so got no concerns there you check for other injury bruising skin tears etc inspection um, and you will do some wound care and you try and get more of a history about what happened what happened before the fall how was he feeling what um, did he fall going to the toilet after the toilet 
Um, did he, was he aware that he was falling? Did he fall forwards? Did he fall backwards? How did he feel once he hit the ground? All these sorts of questions to try and get more information, more clues. And of course, if this person or Mr. Peterson, he's in residential aged care, so it's going to be an incident form and you're going to need to contact the family. Okay, so you've done all the immediate stuff, Mr. Peterson. What are you going to do now? He's survived his fall, he's got a skin tear, there's no broken bones. Okay, the next thing to think about is the other assessments that you should be um, putting into place to try and work out what's going on for Mr. Peterson and to try and prevent the next fall. So there's a list of suggestions there. I'm not going to talk to all of them, but I would like to suggest um, for Mr. Peterson, you've taken his OBS and you now know he has a postural drop. He's actually got quite low blood pressure for an 81 year old anyway, and he's not rushing around, he's slow, he's not exerting himself. So you would want to think about his antihypertensives and you might want to check how much of a diuresis he's getting. Is he hydrated? Is he over diuresis? Is this part of the problem? So a medical review um, or nurse practitioner review is going to be a good step to take for Mr. Peterson in regards to that. If you've got the least bit of suspicion that the fall has anything to do with vision, and his vision hasn't been checked recently, you might want to refer him for a vision check. If you are highly suspicious that's because of his gait and balance, you might want to refer him to the physiotherapist for a review and advice. Um, he was rushing to the toilet, he's got prostatism. Maybe he needs a continence assessment. Is there something else you could do so that he's not rushing to the toilet all the time? maybe a bottle, a urinal close by. Does he use the bell or is he consistently not asking for help? Does he need a prompt um, that he can see or that will help him to use um, call for help? Does he need um, rounding, regular rounding, someone to come by every hour and check that he doesn't need to go to the toilet and that he doesn't have any other needs? And then maybe an environmental assessment, he tripped how did he trip? Hopefully you've got more of the story. Did he trip um, because he lost his balance? Did he trip over his assistive device? Did he, fall, did he lose his balance in the toilet while he was dressing or undressing? And then you can do uh, make an environmental decision about how to make the room safer. Maybe he needs a mat um, to alert staff when his feet hit the floor and he's getting out of bed. So these are just some suggestions for you to think about with someone that's falling. So when you file the incident form, you notice that Mr. Peterson has had multiple falls over the past few weeks. Okay, so this changes the story a little bit, doesn't it? It's not just a one-off, he's a frequent faller, he's high risk. What types of assessments and interventions would you try to um, reduce his risk or to reduce the number of falls he's having. So this is where I think that it's helpful to think about dashboards. So a dashboard is where you <coughs> gather the information and you look at it in a way that you can see the patterns. So with Mr. Peterson, um, I did a dashboard of when his falls took place, the time. And so you can see when you look at the time when the falls are occurring, they're mainly overnight into the early morning and then again in the afternoon. So he's in a rest home. These will be the times when he's in his room resting or there for the night and that's when he's falling. But you can also look at where he's falling. And when you look at where Mr. Peterson is falling, most of his falls are taking place in the toilet. Um, I'll move that up there. And in the bedroom. There's a couple of falls in the shower and in the dining room, but mainly in his bedroom and in the shower. So this will give you information about how you can reduce Mr. Peterson's falls risk. You could add in other um, 
diagrams to help you look at the information depending on the situation. So with Mr. Peterson, you could look at, for example, um, what he was doing when he fell. Okay, so we know he's falling in the toilet and it's fairly obvious he's got some type of urgency, but it would just help you to focus a little bit more about what's going on. And just as an aside, you can use this for all sorts of things. It doesn't have to be falls. It can be behavior, behaviors of concern, for example. Okay, so it's a useful tool to have. Okay, so moving on. What we're going to look at now is falls prevention interventions. What works? And again, I'm not going to go through everything on this page. All right, um, some of it is very self-evident. Um, we've already talked quite a bit about medication, but you do need to be aware it's one of the most common and modifiable risk factors for falls. And though it's difficult in research, observational studies to separate effects of medicine from the underlying medical um, condition, it does pay to look at the person's medicine list very um, clearly and get rid of things that don't need to be there and change the things that are impacting on the person and have more risk than benefit. So there's been a lot of work done around exercise effect and it differs according to the patient population. There is suggestion that exercise is beneficial in preventing falls for older people with less disability, but it potentially increases risk for falls for those requiring higher levels of nursing care. So those are able to stand up but can't walk and just fall over, giving them um, exercise programs for mobility is likely going to increase their risk. Tai Chi has been suggested as beneficial because it helps with strength and balance, and it's been found to be effective in community dwelling older adults. But they have done research in nursing home residents and did not find any statistically significant benefit. Um, for the nurses out there, toileting interventions. There's lots, there's evidence to suggest that falls in the nursing home particularly are commonly occurring while people are toileting, as with Mr. Peterson. But the role of toileting interventions to reduce falls is clear. I imagine it'd be very hard to um, work up a framework of research around that. Um, but for ambulatory residents with urinary symptoms, it makes sense to try and reduce the urinary symptoms through medication review and control of um, pedal edema and regular toileting so they don't have to rush because they've got urge. Bedside commodes, scheduled toileting um, can be useful for select um, people. Although there's no research to support it, it sounds pragmatic and it appears to work in practice. There is evidence to suggest that nursing home residents with incontinence benefit from a multifactorial falls intervention that includes environmental modifications and strength and balance training, as well as toileting regime. And this works um, quite well in that population. Footwear, again, there's no studies evaluating footwear interventions to reduce falls, um, particularly in the institutionalized setting. However, common sense would dictate that non-skid, well-fitting footwear is likely important in reducing falls risk. So get rid of those backless little slippers that just slip on anything. So overall, multifactorial interventions decrease the risk of falls. Um, effective interventions in research has been found to be things like balance and strength exercises, environmental modifications, so rails on those long hallways, making sure that the floor is um, all one level, that you haven't got certain um, sudden light and dark changes so people get confused with the depth when they're looking at the floor. Staff education, staff focus on risk for falls, medication reviews and a comprehensive geriatric review will all help reduce risk for falls. Okay.
Okay, and if you want to go one step further, then you can have a falls prevention program. This is um, on the ward or in residential aged care. Um, so particularly in residential aged care, everyone that comes in needs to have their falls risk identified and the care plan needs to um, identify what those interventions are that are going to um, work for them or should be tried for them. And that risk assessment factors, they all need to be entered into the record as well. So everybody is aware of what the risks are. And there needs to be um, regular review. And this is usually three monthly or six monthly, depending on the situation. Interi is good now for that. That helps you look at um, specifics in the care and function of the um, person in residential age care. And then, of course, there's appropriate prevention and intervention plan for every person in aged care and every person um, on the ward in the acute setting. So, um, full symbols at the head of the bed so people know who are coming in, what that person needs. So, like a HASI sign, H A S I. Do they need help? Do they need, uh, do they need assistance? Um, do they need supervision? Are they independent? H is for hoisted. I just had a little mind blank then. So that can be very useful. And um, as part of your admission um, plan or your review plan, you could refer on to, um, depending on where you are in the country, either a gerontology service like in Waitamata or a geriatric service and ask for a comprehensive, comprehensive review or um, maybe you have an interest yourself as a GP and um, you can do that. Of course, document all falls and complete incident reports because that will help you to see patterns and to learn. And across the um, facility, you should measure and monitor your falls rate. And we did, a, we did some work around that a few years ago in Waitamata and we did see falls rates drop. But one of the things we found that was that in some facilities, they had a very small population of um, residents with Parkinson's who were constant fallers and who ruined the um, facilities falls rates and really um, was quite discouraging. And so if you're doing something like measuring falls rates and injury rates, I think it pays to take account of that small population that are almost consistent constant fallers because of their pathological processes. I'm not saying don't work at reducing their risk falls, but don't get um, discouraged with um, their rate of falling. And then there's other things you can do like monitor whether people are wearing hip protection, what the vitamin D uptake is across the facility, what the exercise program participation is, um, have you got a staff education program? Have you got a falls, um, what's the word I'm wanting? Someone that advocates for reducing falls risk um, across the facility, falls champion. And of course, attention to the environment is always very important. So there's a lot of things that you can do within your setting to um, highlight the falls risk for your population and things that you consider um, implementing and putting into practice depending on your setting. Okay, so moving on. This is an example of a falls risk assessment. I've chosen the MORSE because it's quite commonly used, but there are lots of falls risk assessments out there. Um, what's important is that you use one consistently so that you can um, assess risk in the individual, but also so you've got a risk, um, an idea across your population of what's happening. So this one is composed of six items, history of falling in the past three months. And remember a history of falling increases risk for falls, presence of any secondary diagnosis, use of an assistive device, whether they've got something attached to them like a urinary catheter or an intravenous line, whether they have an abnormal gait, whether they have impaired mental status, and then they're scored according to that. And the score can range from zero, in this tool it ranges from zero to 125. And then you can decide according to the score, how much of a risk program you need to put into place for that individual. However, having pushed 
the idea of having a falls risk assessment, and it is necessary, um, a prospective cohort study of 183 nursing home residents in Sweden found that both the staff's judgment of falls risk and a prior history of falls were better predictors of future falls than commonly used screening tests for falls. So yes, use the screening tests, but also go with what you know, that the person in front of you has a high falls risk because they're already falling. And when you look at them, you can see that they've got high risk. And the other suggestion I make is that if you're working in residential aged care or going into residential aged care, that you should consider every resident in there as having a high risk for falls. Now, another really good assessment tool that you might like to learn more about is the Tenetti Performance Orientated Mobility Assessment. Um, if you haven't got access to a physiotherapist, for example, you can teach yourself using this um, little education package how to do a, an assessment of mobility and falls risk. There are three parts to it. The first part is the lower extremity examination and it focuses on mechanical issues. So like um, ability to bend the ankle, for example, um, any pathological changes in the feet. The second part is a neurologic examination, looking for muscle weakness, impaired power, impaired proprioception, cerebellar signs, ex um, for example. And the third part is a functional evaluation of the person's falls risk. Now it sounds complex, but once you know what you're doing, you can do it in about in 15 minutes. And the reference for it is on the last slide. So with the balance and gait part of it, so this is the third part, the um, patient begins the balance section of the test seated in a straight chair and they do a number of activities such as maintaining sitting balance, rising from the chair, standing, standing with feet close together, um, the sternal nudge, standing with feet close together and eyes closed, turning 360 degrees, sitting down, and you score each part. Um, and the gait, during the gait section of the test, you, wa you watch the patient walk at their normal pace on a level surface, and you grade various aspects of the gait. So you look at the initiation of the step, the step length, the foot clearance, step symmetry, step continuity, excursions from the path, trunk posture, etc. And you score that. And what I really like about it, um, when I'm assessing people, is that it gives me the language that I need when I'm describing a walk. And I see some really funny walks. And sometimes I just don't know where to start. And I think that something like this helps you to think about, break down the gate into its various aspects and think about what you're seeing um, instead of looking at the whole whole picture and not really seeing the detail. So this is what the assessment tool looks like. And again, you um, score people and you reach a total. And that total will indicate that person's risk for falls. And there's the link. Okay. Right. Okay, so podiatry. Podiatrists are often overlooked, I feel, in their ability to re reduce falls risk. Um, I think it's something that individuals have to pay for to have their toenails at attended to or their um, calluses. Um, but really, podiatry is far more than that. It is a degree. They are health clinicians and they can screen for balance and gait problems, foot deformity, treat pathology prescribe appropriate footwear or refer on as appropriate and they can do education and they can teach foot strengthening exercises. So I think that that's someone that should be on your list of clinicians that you can refer to, even if the person has to pay for it, um, because it could be helpful in reducing risk for falls if they've got um, feet that are one of the main causes of the problem. So Foot pathology is an intrinsic risk factor. And when you look at people's feet, you think about ankle flexibility, um, their toe plantar flexor strength, 
plant a sensation, foot deformity, foot pain, okay? Um, and you think about the relationship of those pathologies um, and the impact on their balance and their mobility. Foot pathology affects one in three community dwelling older adults and it's a hidden problem. We don't look at feet. But as a gerontology nurse, I learn a lot about people by looking at their feet, looking in their mouth and looking at their feet. I can <laughs> tell you a lot about the person's health just from those two things. Okay, and then I think um, the other thing to think about is nutrition and falls. So there is a significant relationship between malnutrition and falls. And there's been a lot of research done around malnutrition and falls and malnutrition and health amongst older adults. So we know that um, in malnourished patients, if there are nutrition interventions put, put into place, that falls risk decreases. So high, in, um, high energy, high protein diets help build up muscle and helps reduce risk for falls. We also know that there's a high prevalence of malnutrition and poor oral intake in patients who fall in hospital. And we know that by the time people enter residential aged care, they're often malnourished because they've been barely surviving at home, cooking less, eating more easily accessible foods that are not necessarily good nutritionally. So I've seen so many people that enter into residential aged care malnourished and then immediately start to gain weight, start to gain muscle, start to gain in health. Um, vitamin D. So my, vitamin D is very important in the person's diet or in um, through prescribing cholecalciferol because it helps maintain calcium and phosphorus homeostasis. And by optimizing bone health and muscle function, you reduce risk for falls. Okay, so I think I've reached the end of my time a little bit ahead. So just to summarize, with falls, it is a very complex topic. People have done PhDs, research and more on falls. This has been really just an overview of some of the important um, factors to consider when you're looking at falls in your older adults. Wherever you see your older adults, a falls risk assessment is important. It's important as part of their health assessment. It's important because if you can put into place interventions earlier, then you can reduce risk of falls. You can keep that person um, at home more safely for longer um, and you can help reduce injuries from falls. Um, admissions to hospital and then admissions to residential aged care from falls. So I think if you look at um, all those intrinsic factors that raise risk for falls and you consider that in your health assessment of older adults, you do a medication review and think about the impact on, of um, those medications on your older adults. Um, and you think about interventions that reduce risk for people that are already falling then you are, um, you're doing well. And if you develop an interest in um, reducing falls risk for whatever setting that you're working in, then um, you're to be commended. I think um, for myself, it took me a long time to understand that it's the basics. Um, it's not the complexities, but it's the basics that help you um, reduce um, risk for whatever setting and whatever, um, um, health issue it is, and it's the basics that improve quality of life for older adults. Okay, so, questions? Michelle asks, is dementia a cause for recurrent falls, and what can we do to reduce this? Okay, so cognitive impairment or dementia, uh, dementia um, does increase risk for falls on a number of levels. Okay, not only have you got the cognitive impairment co um, component where they lack, um, lack insight of risk in situations, the judgment's impaired. You've got a brain that is um, failing. So you've got slow processing, 
you've got slowed ability to react quickly in circumstances. You've got, um, it's not just about the thinking of the person that's impaired in dementia. Um, dementia is brain failure. So you think about all the functions of the brain and they will all eventually be impaired and um, by dementia. And so you've got brain, you've got cell death, you've got reduced um, communication between the cells, and that's going to impact on things like proprioception, for example, um, cardiovascular ability to maintain stability of blood pressure, um, balance in the inner ear, eyesight issues, um, whatever you think about in, as brain function will be impacted by dementia. Thanks, Janet. I've got another question here from um, Leanne. What about when an anxious patient has been prescribed intranasal clonazepam or midazolam for anxiety or nausea? Is this a good idea if they have several other risk factors as well? Okay, so that's um, a good question. It's also one that we could probably spend a lot of time discussing because first of all, you've got to think, what are the pros and cons of the drug that's being used? Okay. Are the pros outweighing the cons in that individual situation? So I don't know how bad her anxiety is, but I know that some older people have extreme anxiety. And so that impacts on quality of life. And so you've got to think, do I have a increased false risk because of this, or do I have an extremely anxious um, person who can't access something that will help calm them? So there's no right or wrong answer here. It depends on the individual person, depends on their circumstances, it depends on their goals of care, depends on um, their quality of life, and it depends on their prognosis. And I think that's a decision that needs to be made probably with a group of clinicians, with the person if they're able to participate or with the family, because everyone's gonna have different ideas in that sort of situation. Thanks, Janet. Uh, that's, ah, here we go, got another one come through here. Um, what are some simple messages that I can impart to a 93 year old in LTC who refuses to ask for assistance as she does not want to go to the care, at, care at timetable? and gets agitated if rushed or feels hassled by carers. And this is causing risks for falling. Mm, yes, and I think that's typical of a lot of older people. She wants to maintain her independence. She wants to do what she wants to do when she wants to do. There may be some lack of insight into the risk that she's taking. I'm not sure what her cognitive ability is. Maybe you should start by um, gaining an idea of her cognitive ability. Does she lack? insight into um, the risk or does she not care about the risk okay so it pays to um, in these situations to explore and gain more knowledge can you work around her um, reluctance to call caregivers can you do intentional rounding for example can you um, have some sort of alert mat so that it's triggered when she gets out of bed there are a number of things that you could consider here um, if you're the person that's working with this lady and you get to know her more, you'll have more understanding of what things might be more successful than others. Thank you. I still keep coming in. Um, now these are just people appreciating your presentation and thanking you. Here we have, we've got another one here. Uh, somebody on low sodium, on blood pressure medication and furizumide what should be looked at or resolved first to reduce frequent falls? So they've got low blood sodium, I take it. Low sodium, yes. And they've got, they're on antihypertensives and they've got low blood pressure. Yeah. Okay, all right. So um, I'm not sure how low the sodium is, but so you need to, depending on that, um, you might be able to raise it a little bit naturally, non-pharmacologically um, or with slow sodium. Whoops, sorry, that's my um, telling me I've, <laughs> telling me I've finished. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if this person is actually on a low sodium diet. Oh, okay. All oh, right, so low, low sodium diet because of their cardiac issues. Okay. Might be, might be, because this person is on BP meds and furosemide as well. Yeah, okay. So, and they're falling. 
Yeah. So that's a tricky one because you want a low blood pressure, but how low a blood pressure do you want? What is the prognosis of this person? Again, it's all about prognosis. It's all about their goals for care. Um, what is quality of life for that person? Because you may be able to buy them a bit more life with a really low, low blood pressure, but they're falling all over the place and they feel really bad. Is that worth it? So you've got to sort of balance the, the pros and the cons again against what that person wants, what the family um, feels the person wants, and then you've got to make a decision. This is not really so much around the, the science of medicine or nursing. This is more around the art of, of medicine, the art of nursing. You've got to look a little bit wider than the low blood pressure and the guidelines and you've got to look at quality of life, prognosis, goals of care. I hope that that's helpful. Again, there's no black and white answers. You have to look at the individual. Absolutely. No more questions, Janet. So I think it Thanks. just remains to thank you for a very, very useful and informative uh, session. Lots of people expressing their gratitude and appreciation okay. and wanting to see it again, I think, when it's um, available on our website. So uh, thank right. you to you, Janet, for, um, for coming along today. And thank you to everybody who's participated and I'll, I'll close the meeting. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.